Godzilla is a monster of many talents. He's a malevolent force of chaos, a goofy good-natured hero, a destroyer and a protector, and also a national treasure. But where did this giant green goliath come from? How has he stayed relevant for over 60 years? And what does the future have in store for the king of the monsters? So welcome back to Evo Chronicles, where we showcase the evolution of movies, video games, famous characters and much more. So if you enjoy our content, make sure to hit the like, hit the bell and subscribe to the channel for more videos. The Big G's origins can be traced back to 1945, when the atomic bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki left a jagged scar on the cultural consciousness of Japan. And as the nation began its miraculous post-war recovery, they coped with the unthinkable tragedy through art. Out of humanity's darkest moments, a king was born, Godzilla. But Godzilla wasn't the first kaiju by a long shot. He was directly inspired by King Kong and the beasts from 20,000 Fathoms, as well as the real-life Lucky Dragon incident, where a Japanese fishing ship was irradiated from a US hydrogen bomb test. Toho developed the movie under the codename Project G for Giant. Although they didn't know exactly what Godzilla would look like, early conceptions ranged from a massive octopus to a monster with a mushroom cloud for a head before finally settling on the iconic design inspired by dinosaurs and alligators, as well as a name derived from the Japanese world for Gorilla, Gorira, and Whale Kujira. Gojira was nature's revenge for mankind's meddling with destructive forces they barely understand. He's the embodiment of the pain and sorrow felt by all the people who suffered unprecedented devastation, and at the end of the day, he was also a very sweaty man in a suit. Toho originally planned on using stop motion to create the colossal creature, but it would have been super expensive for what was turning out to be the costliest Japanese film ever made up to that point. Instead, the crew led by Iji Tsuburaya and director Ishiro Honda designed a 220 pound 6.5 foot tall suit made of bamboo, metal mesh and a dense latex rubber. And since portraying a giant monster in a suit hadn't really been done before, they didn't put much thought into how Haruo Nakajima, the performer inside the costume, would feel. Under the hot studio lights required by the high-speed cameras, the suit's temperature skyrocketed to 140 degrees, and Nakajima could only spend 3 minutes at a time inside it before passing out. Thankfully, his suffering was up for nothing. When it released in 1954, Gojira was a modest hit in Japan, enough to earn a sequel the next year, Godzilla Raids Again. But Godzilla made an even bigger splash overseas, released in 1956 as Godzilla King of the Monsters. The American version made heavy cuts to Honda's original film, lightening the anti-atomic message, removing a subplot about arranged marriage, and shoehorning in scenes starring Raymond Burr as an American reporter covering Godzilla's rampage. Godzilla was undergoing eras of evolution. Following the first two films, Godzilla would slumber for a few years, as Toho introduced new kaiju in their own standalone films like the Soaring Scorcher Rodan and the mysterious Mothra. The market for monsters was booming, so in 1962, Toho pitted the two biggest, and I mean biggest, names in kaiju cinema against each other in a no-holds-barred deathmatch. King Kong vs Godzilla originally began as King Kong meets Frankenstein, but when that fell through, Toho quickly snapped up the production and inserted their own icon instead. Back then, Kong was the biggest draw, and Godzilla was still seen as an evil heel. So despite the urban legend that two different endings were produced for the US and Japanese audience, in every single version the ape comes out on top. Kong vs Godzilla marked the turn in Toho's terrible lizard. The movie was a lot more lighthearted and fun than its grim predecessors, which kind of goes against the original Gojira's somber anti-war message. But hey, the kids loved it, and Toho were off to the races. They released a total of 15 Godzilla movies during the Showa era, named after the Japanese emperor at the time. And while it introduced formidable foes in King Ghidorah and Mechagodzilla, as the series continued, the budget shrank and the stories got sillier. Son of Godzilla introduced Minera. Goji's awful offspring will look like a fossilized turd. And by the time Godzilla vs Gigan rolled around, the destructive beasts responsible for the horrific deaths of untold thousands are just hanging out on Monster Island, cracking wise and shooting the breeze. The original run ended in 1974, and it took nearly a decade for Toho to return him to his route. 
with the return of Godzilla in 1984. The Heisei era was a welcome return to the days of a cold, uncaring creature. He still battled monsters that threatened his turf, but this Godzilla was a far cry from the flying friendly cartoon character he devolved into. The Heisei films also followed a strict continuity. Much like the new Halloween, they ignored every single film except the original and told a serialized story about a slightly futuristic society battling a cast of killer kaiju, ending with Godzilla's heroic death at the hands of Destroya. However, Godzilla wasn't allowed to rest in peace for too long. He returned from the grave after his many infamous American adaptations. Ever since he first stomped ashore, the US has been obsessed with the Green Giant. He might as well be the most beloved Japanese import next to Nintendo's Mario. But Godzilla is uniquely tied to the country and its culture, which is probably why most attempts to Americanize him miss the mark. In the 70s, American studios were licensing Godzilla for various properties, like the Marvel comic that pitted him against the Avengers. In the 80s, horror movie director Steve Miner chopped around a big-budget blockbuster adaptation called Godzilla King of the Monsters in 3D. But he couldn't find the right studio, so instead, Toho released the first Heisei film in the US, renamed Godzilla 1985. After that, TriStar Pictures snapped up the rights in 1992 and spent years developing the film with speed director Jan de Mont, who commissioned a faithful redesign from the FX legend Stan Winston. They scratched the whole idea and came up with this monstrosity. When they showed this design to Toho, the Japanese execs didn't really know how to deal with it. But they eventually approved, and after the film proved to be a box office bust, they trashed the 98 design. The 98 Godzilla isn't a total loss though, the animated series inspired by it was actually pretty decent. But the reception was so bad that Toho actually revived their own franchise to save Godzilla's good name, unleashing the Millennium series. Unlike the previous two eras, the Millennium films don't follow a strict continuity. It was more like an anthology series that told a variety of standalone stories about the big guy. 2004's Final Wars marked Godzilla's 50th anniversary, and to celebrate, Toho announced that they were putting Godzilla to bed for 10 years. In the meantime, the success of Marvel Studios sent Hollywood on a quest to find the next cinematic universe, and Toho's Beast Collection was a goldmine. Marvel's shared universe actually got off to a good start with Gareth Edwards' 2014 Godzilla. It's not a perfect film, but honestly, the biggest flaw is not enough Brian Cranston and too much focus on the human characters but they absolutely nailed the most important part, which is Godzilla's design. It's a perfect mix between classic vibes and modern graphics. After the Americans' film success, Toho itself got back to the Godzilla game with Shin Godzilla, a return to the monster's deeply political roots that transformed him into a symbol of the 2011 Fukushima meltdown, as well as three awesome animes set in a far distant apocalyptic future. Meanwhile in the States, Legendary Pictures was entering phase 2 of its Monsterverse with King of the Monsters, bringing back the big guy and introducing some old friends like Mothra and Rodan as well as Godzilla's ultimate enemy, Monster Zero himself, the great King Ghidorah. And now in 2021, we've still got the rematch of the century, with Godzilla set to show down against Skull Island's Colossal Kong. So why has Godzilla succeeded when so many shared universes fizzled out? Is it his iconic design and decades of history, his status as a symbol of the atomic age, or are colossal kaiju clashing over cities just a concept that stands the test of time? Either ways, it doesn't look like anything's going to derail Godzilla's dominance anytime soon. So that was it for Godzilla's evolution, for now. I'm sure there will be more movies to talk about in the future. But for now, make sure to like this video, subscribe to Evo Chronicles for more evolution videos, and comment below, tell us what you want to see in the next video. And I'll see you in the next one.